Welcome back to 5050 Day, where we are pushing for gender equity. And we have uh, Sharon Bagwan Rolls with us. She is the founder and coordinator of the Fiji based women's media organization, FemLink Pacific. And she's pioneered mobile women's community radio in the Pacific Islands. She's an activist for women's rights and human rights. And I understand that, among many other things, uh, I've been reading up on your, your website that you have a women's weather watch and you've had some weather to watch. So what's what's going on where you are and tell us why a women's weather watch? Yes, well, welcome to the Pacific and it's great to be able to be sharing our experience in this amazing global campaign today. Um, women's weather watch came about because we have community media technology and um, SMS capabilities, but what we weren't seeing almost seven years ago was women actually accessing information about climate change and particularly disasters. And also because of the underrepresentation of women in local level decision making, they weren't able to influence the responses or preparedness. So we thought Women's Weather Watch was going to be an important model. First of all, we thought just to share the weather information but it's now become a really important interactive advocacy platform where we're not just communicating weather updates to rural women across Fiji, but also in Pacific Island uh, countries as well, but we're also gathering information. So with the new media communications technology, women and young women of all diversities are able to report on what's actually happening and then through this gathering of information, we're able to influence um, disaster management and uh, both at country level and regional level. So been very important the last two weeks, particularly as we're seeing more and more, not just intensifying disasters, but out of season ones as well, which is far more concerning. Yeah, and so, you know, you are working with um a variety of different women, but a lot of rural women. And and what is it that, in your experience, rural women might need from gender development or development period that perhaps you know urban women might not have the same concerns? One of the biggest gaps for women in terms of their development priorities is infrastructure, because more and more from a profit or corporate-based development agenda, you see a lot more development taking place. Infrastructure happens where there are hotels, where there's business, but not where the rural women are. And not enough infrastructure is developed along the lines of supporting women's entrepreneurship in their communities. As a market vendor told us many years ago in our first documentary, women want to sell their produce from the doorstep. Now, if they don't have electricity, if they don't have access to information communication, and if they're not in decision-making um, structures, how do they then profit from development? So it's infrastructure, it's access to decision-making, it's the resourcing of the kinds of models of women's development priorities that we need to see a lot more of. And your your organization does a number of different things, but you also have a suitcase radio project. And as someone who used to be a radio host, I, I just loved it. So tell us tell us what it is, how it developed. It sounds like it's thriving. It's yeah, it was one of those dreams where, you know, you talk about let's get women on the airwaves, but um, having worked in public broadcasting and television as well, I didn't just want to be doing um, a radio show where you just talk about the women. So this was actually about what is the technology available where women can claim it, use it. And um, so I found the suitcase radio it's appropriate, it's accessible, it's portable, it's um, enabled us to train a number of young women to be able to broadcast rural women, and more importantly, rural uh, women with disabilities as well. So it's the kind of technology with a suitcase radio where if you're a person with visual impairment, you can feel the console, you can work with the console. But the suitcase radio meant that instead of waiting for women to come to the capital where the big broadcasters are, we were taking um, a 100-watt transmitter, setting it up um, with a broadcast unit, 
with women in their communities. So it becomes part of this fantastic convening of women coming together. We invest time in women's pre-production. They're putting their thoughts together. We produce radio programs and then they get become part of the broadcast. Um, so it's all formatted and organized around their local community. And when the suitcase radio becomes a bit of a women's caravan, really, because we're able to travel around with the suitcase radio and share the stories from one community to the next. And something um, that we also developed um, in the last few years was a television component where women are not just being um, heard on the radio, but there's a television component. And we have a new television show called Radio with Pictures. So it's also oh about... I love it. It's all interconnected, which is very exciting. So you've got the portable, and then now with the confidence of these women leaders who have had the exposure and the experience of talking about their issues on the small radio, we're able to now amplify it here in the capital city. Our radio station in the capital runs 24 hours. We've been able to train young women to be able to set up the only radio station for and by women in um, a rural center in Fiji on our second island. And um, with the radio with pictures component, women are not just heard, but they're also seen as well. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been fascinated by and a champion of uh, global women's media projects. And, you know, some people might look at media and say, oh, well, that's kind of an add on. Don't people need food? Don't people need this? Don't people need that? Why is media so important to getting to 50 50 and having gender equity? So I think it's really important in, in a number of ways. One, where from my own regional perspective in the Pacific, we have some of the lowest numbers of women in parliament, in decision making, in traditional and local governance. So if they're not part of that 50-50, they're not going to be the women who are heard in, in the public media. So once again, we have to look at the 50-50 in terms of the voice for development, the voice for inclusion and participation. The other thing also is that quite often, I think um, a lot of development agencies see media only as a publicity platform. So to talk about a project or to, to get the brandy. Whereas from a community media um, perspective, it's also about accountability. The accountability of accessing the airwaves for, for the public. Whereas previously, one thought that it's only for big organizations. The accountability and engagement in terms of being able to publish your own news is very important. It's not false news, it's real news in terms of what women are saying. And, and the use of technology in a way that brings about that 50-50 visibility uh, in all media and communications platforms. So I think it should no longer be this add-on, but it's an integral part of everything that happens, including progressing inclusive development. And you've been active uh, in speaking out about politics in Fiji when things have, have been disturbing. If anyone hears a helicopter, as we're talking right now, there's protest right here in San Francisco, and, and we certainly have had a lot of protesting in America of late. So what is the role of women in, in civic uh, protest and you know, speaking out when you're not necessarily in agreement with your government? So we've seen a wave of women's activism and for FemLink Pacific, we see ourselves as part of that wave of activism dating back to the anti-nuclear movement when um, young women through the YWCA, through the first university set up for our Pacific Island region, the University of the South Pacific started engaging and organizing. It was, um, it's important to understand that Pacific Island governments are very young in terms of democracy. So Fiji, you know, we, we attained independence from Great Britain in 1970. And that was also where young women were talking about what it meant to be part of a politically independent country. We've then also had our waves of 
militarism, our waves of the overthrow of democratically elect, elected governments. And once again, you've seen women take to nonviolent protest um, in many forms. Femlink actually emerged in 2000 as a result of the overthrow of the then Labour government. And we emerged, um, one of my roles was to organize a peace vigil, which started with one vigil, but continued throughout the 56 day hostage crisis. And through that, we saw the need to continue to engage around ensuring women were heard, women were part of a peace building or the rebuilding of democracy. In 2006, we had another military coup, um, but unfortunately it required a number of different strategies. So the women's peace movement and the women's human rights movement in this country have had to play a number of different types of roles. But what's been really important is that the women's voice has been a strong voice for human rights, rule of law and democracy. And it's our contribution as a feminist organization in Fiji, but also in the Pacific, where we've also seen political turmoil, to be that voice of nonviolence, to be that voice now not just of responding to crises, but I think what's really important is investment in the women's peace and security measures that also enhance prevention. And that goes back to why we need to see more women in decision making, not just in parliament, but in places where decisions are made so that they can provide that analysis to say, hang on, if we're not addressing X, Y, Z, there is greater chance of conflict, um, whether in communities or spiraling out. So that's how women continue to contribute, not just to the democratization process, but an inclusive and a sustainable peace process as well. And just so finally, um, where do you see, you know, it's always, hard to predict the future, but sometimes a lot of people today have mentioned 2025 as a possible benchmark for reassessing where we are going with gender equity and equality and parity. Where do you think uh, women will be in Fiji, in the Pacific Islands, and women will be globally in terms of advancing, um, hopefully, over the next uh, you know, 10 years or so? I actually hope that it's a lot sooner than uh, 2025. We have as an, a feminist organization, the 2020 vision, because we feel it's, we don't have the luxury of time. When you're so underrepresented, you can't wait for a global benchmark. So we're working as best as we can to support women in the lead up to our 2018 elections, but also to ensure that by the time we're, by the time we get to 2020, We've contributed as an organization to supporting far more rural women to be recognized, to be appointed to decision making, that we're seeing more young women grow into leadership. And that when we talk about women's participation, we're talking about women of all diversities at a bigger table and that we don't have to keep quantifying or qualifying the reason why, but that it's just happening. Well, Sharon Bagwan roles of Family Pacific. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure and happy 50-50 day. Thank you and same to you.